overnight. Yes. Oh, I was in the U.S. I missed all the drama. Oh, well. Came back, I... <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, members of the media, and editors, senior correspondents, and uh, journalists. And uh, welcome to this conversation, which is being staged by the African National Congress. And hopefully, President will form part of a series of conversations where the President wearing the cap and the banner and the logo of the African National Congress gets to interact on you know, um, much more deeply with society utilizing the services of our clients in the media. The president is here to reflect and exchange ideas with you, but also to reflect on the outcomes of the three-day National Executive Committee meeting that is uh, about to wrap up still in session, but uh, a big part of the work has been done. And uh, with that, Mr. President, I also want to say we are joined here. I was going to read out the number, but it will take up a lot of the time that uh, I am sure uh, fellow um, media colleagues are keen to get into a Q&A. This is not a press briefing, it's a conversation. So we're going to keep things light. We're going to keep things conversational. Uh, but of course, we also have to manage the time so that the president is excused at the right time to go and close the National Executive Committee meeting. But I will try and facilitate as best as possible so that everyone has a bite. And, and um, so that is that, having done so. For those that don't know me, my name is Masheni Benu Mutsiri. I'm a member of the National Executive Committee of the ANC and its appointed national spokesperson. With that, let me hand over to the President for his introductory remarks. The President. Well, thank you very much, Masengi. It's uh, wonderful to see uh, such a galaxy of uh, uh, media people. Uh, didn't expect to see so many of you, but uh, it will be good to have a conversation with yourselves. As Masengi said, it's just really a fireside type of conversation. We are currently wrapping up the meeting of the National Executive Committee. This doesn't work? Okay. All right. We are currently wrapping up the meeting of the National Executive Committee. A NEC, which has really been rich in terms of its content and substance, covering a whole range of issues that are important to the lives of South Africans. We obviously started off with a political overview, which is, often, which is always given by the President. And in it, I sought to cover the progress that we have made and are making in addressing the priorities that we set out uh, at the January 8th statement. The first priority, as you might recall, was the renewal of the African National Congress and its unity. And the second one was to address the issue of load shedding and uh, bringing load shedding to an end as soon as we possibly can. And the third was to address the issue of the economy and to get all social partners to work together on issues that are pertinent to the growth of our economy. And the fourth one was to attend to the issue of basic services that need to be delivered to the people of South Africa, right across the country, and in the course of doing so to address the local government challenges. And the fifth was to address the issue of crime and corruption. And the sixth one was for a better Africa and a better world. In addressing all these issues, we reflected on the progress that is being made in renewing the ANC. We were all rather pleased with the progress that we are making 
in making sure that we do renew the ANC and unite the ANC and make the ANC more cohesive. We reflected on how, for instance, various structures of the ANC are beginning to work well, various committees. The NEC is uh, a united NEC and giving leadership uh, to the organization and the working committee also functions extremely well and people have taken their tasks very, very seriously on the National Working Committee. And the NEC subcommittees are also meeting on a regular basis and producing really good work, work that has been presented to the NEC today. And it, it is very refreshing that we have NEC subcommittees that deal with policy matters, but that go beyond that, that also deal with implementation issues. And we also looked at the SGO, the real engine of the organization, and we're very pleased to see that our SGO is coordinating the work of the ANC very effectively and seeking to modernize the African National Congress. And of course, we reflected on our leagues, that the leagues are now all set to have their uh, conferences, with the Youth League having had its own after an eight-year lapse or period of not holding, uh, having a real functioning uh, Youth League. The Women's League is now going to follow, and thereafter the Veterans League. And so, as far as the ANC is concerned, we are pleased. We also had the Integrity Commission uh, explaining how it is going to function to the NEC, and we also dealt uh, in part with the terms of reference, which will be finalized later. So in totality, we've now got an ANC machinery that is humming, beginning to gel, and uh, we're dealing with substantive issues, and that speaks to the first priority that the National Executive Committee during the January 8th statement spoke to. We also got a report on uh, issues that have to do with load shedding, and uh, the NEC was rather encouraged to see that the electricity availability factor is continuing to rise and is hovering around 60%, with the incidence of load shedding having been reduced from around six now, stage six rather, hovering around stage three, and great progress uh, in stabilizing the ESCOM system and uh, various units now coming back to operation and with more, uh, like Kusile, which will come back a little earlier than what we had anticipated. So we, NEC got a sense that uh, we're now grappling with the issues that have been a real bareback and a real concern to the people of South Africa. And we also dealt with the challenge that uh, is looming and out there with regard to transmission. Uh, the transmission is under a great deal of challenge and stress, and we therefore need to look at a variety of options, what we do in relation to to transmission. Obviously, it requires quite a lot of money. It's been suggested that it could require up to 210 billion rand, and others say it could be 250 billion rand. And um, with the debt that ESCOM is carrying right now, it's going to be a challenge, uh, as well as the assistance that it has got from the Fiscus, and uh, with uh, uh, the Fiscus. Uh, being challenged as well in a number of ways in terms of meeting the needs of South Africans. So we have a, a problem there, but the good part is that we all resolve that we've got to find innovative ways of addressing this challenge, and we should not sit by and uh, let it slide for years and years, uh, just as we did with um, the whole issue of generation in the past. 
So that was discussed and good discussions in that regard. We then got an input on the economy as well, particularly on the cost of living that is continuing to rise and um, what we should start looking at, which we will do so at a government level uh, in terms of uh, uh, what options are there. There could well be options, but uh, that uh, is something that we will need to look at. But then again, we also looked at uh, how we can bolster investments, and we looked at how the reforms uh, are being implemented and what progress is being made and uh, reflected on the fact that, yes, a number of reforms are now underway. The reforms that are absolutely necessary, particularly in our logistics uh, area, for instance, rail and our ports, uh, and how we can pay more attention to that, but more particularly working with the private sector uh, and we, the NEC and it uh, note that uh, at government level we've been uh, collaborating with the private sector on how to address some of these challenges uh, and there's been great cooperation in that regard. Then we looked at the issue of uh, basic services, the issue that is of great concern to South Africans, water uh, and sanitation uh, as well as uh, the roads uh, in various parts of our country, the potholes, uh, and how best the basic services issues can be addressed, particularly uh, how local government can be assisted uh, to address the, local, uh, the basic services issue. One of the issues that I, I did raise is that in the end, with the failures and the weaknesses and the lack of capacity that many of our local uh, governments have, we've got to find a way of giving them support. I reflected rather sadly on the issue of Hamanskral, for instance, where for the longest time, the National Water Department, Water and Sanitation Department raised the issue of the waterworks at Royval, and very little was done uh, in putting uh, the Royval waterworks in order. And up to and including the National Department even taking uh, that local municipality, the metro, to court. And as we reflected on that, we realized that National government does need to utilize uh, pieces of legislation that we have to intervene because we cannot leave our people continuing to live uh, in squalor without water, without proper sanitation uh, when, uh, the local, when we know that the local government does not have capacity, it does not have the way with all and we now need to intervene, and uh, we now have a way, one, to engage local government and uh, find a way of cooperating with them, and uh, also to intervene more at the national government level, which is precisely what we're now going to start focusing attention on, rather than just to leave everything to the wiles of local government uh, in other situations, of course, there's a challenge of uh, money, the budget, but in others, it's a capacity issue, uh, it's a capability issue where we now need to find ways of intervening directly. That was broadly supported. Um, we also reflected on what happened in one of our imbizos when the premier of uh, KZN actually made the call that we now need national government to make more direct interventions uh, to, to address all these challenges because much as we expect local government to execute some of their given uh, functions in terms of their areas of competence, they face challenges. They don't have the engineers that uh, are needed. They don't have the capabilities, the staff, and the skills that they need to have. And therefore, 
the district development model and intergovernmental cooperation needs to be heightened so that we cooperate much more and ensure that <clears throat> services are provided to our people. We dealt, of course, with the issue of uh, uh, crime and corruption and uh, what uh, was raised more prominently was uh, the spate of criminality that is happening in a number of places in our country and uh, how we want the police to make uh, more stronger interventions. But we also said that the community policing forums need to be strengthened, need to be empowered so that they are able uh, to lessen the incidence of criminality, but without uh, saying that the police themselves should not execute their work. And we should also deal with the challenge of the Zamazamas, particularly the illegal mining. And that was raised quite strongly, and uh, we are going to be uh, focusing uh, on that and addressing it uh, quite prominently. Then we also dealt with the issue of uh, a better Africa and a better world. And I, I gave a report on the African leaders mission uh, to uh, Ukraine and Russia and uh, I gave them uh, the 10 issues that we raised with uh, the two leaders, President Zelensky and President Putin and uh, we informed them that uh, our visit was well received. They listened because we set out the 10 issues. And the first one was that, you know, we want them to listen uh, not only to each other, but also to listen to our own African perspective and our own African experience, not that our continent is not dogged by conflicts, but that many of the conflicts that we, we've had and even those that we have now, the only solution and the best solution is through negotiation, and we put that across to them, that we're calling for peace, that we would like to see peace because the lack of peace in that part of the world is having a negative impact on us. Uh, and we see it in the rise of uh, uh, food prices, uh, shortage of grains and shortage of fertilizers, fertilizers prices of shot through the roof, and we get most of that from that part of the world. And uh, we also said, thirdly, uh, as African nations, the seven of us, we uh, want to reiterate uh, the principle that um, every country's territorial integrity should be respected and, uh, in terms of the UN uh, Charter. And uh, we then said that we want to see de-escalation of the conflict uh, so that uh, the people, uh, the, in the two countries, the leaders begin to talk. And then we spoke about the confidence-building measures, which encompass quite a number of points that are, are practical in terms of what they can do. We also reflected on BRICS and said that um, the BRICS summit is going ahead and we're finalizing our discussions on the format and how it will be held and that I'm in the course of talking to all the various uh, four heads of states in relation to that and that uh, an announcement will be made in due course. So the NEC has been proceeding very well and uh, in the last hour or two we are now going to reflect on uh, how well we have implemented our past manifesto, as tomorrow we begin to reflect on drafting a new manifesto for the forthcoming elections. There's been a very good spirit, a very good mood, and very good cooperation in the NEC, and uh, this also will end up being one of the really better NEC meetings that we have held. So it's been going very smoothly, it's got a lot of meat, a lot of substance, and a lot of real good content uh, in our discussions. And I'm just sorry that as a media, uh, you are not able to participate because you would have seen the real wealth of uh, the way uh, we have our discussions. 
uh, and maybe next time I'll whisper to the SG to see whether you know you you can't be invited uh, to sit in. Uh, but the SG is very very uh, systematic, and he may not agree uh, to my proposal. Thank you very much. <laughs> President, I am going to start to this side. I will suggest that we try and not ask several questions at a time because we're trying to make it conversational. And I don't even have a paper and pen, so I won't be able to write. So yes, ask one question one each. So <laughs> that's, that's my request. That's my and then the president will then respond to, let us say it's Kanita. Will then respond to Kanita's question, not in a, in, a, in a responding manner. It may very well be, what do you think? Converse, you know, yeah. Conversational. So over to you, Kanita, and then after that, I will go to, to Mr. Major. Let's have good. I'll give. Uh, no, 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 <laughs> uh, Mr. President, thank you for this opportunity and thank you the, for the ANC uh, for um, uh, uh, arranging such. We really appreciate it. I'm, I'm interested in the, uh, in the conversations going toward the elections, and obviously, coalitions has been the, the flag word. And this week, we saw um, you know conversation or word around um, something happening in a local government sphere, which is in Ekoleleni, where an ANC leader you know basically expressed that an arrangement the ANC has with the ESF is not yielding any positive outcomes there. And there's so much of instability we've seen through this um, uh, 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 marriage of convenience the ANC has with the ESF in unseated and different municipalities in the country. Yeah. So, if you could just talk a little bit about you know, the complicity of the ANC in the instability we see in, in local government, and then how do, you, how do you fix that and how do you sell an alternative narrative to citizens? when a lot of the problems that we see is, is kind of, you know, you can point directly to the instability that has come about because of the swapping in, uh, of, of, of governments uh, there. And then, uh, if I could just take the opportunity one time uh, to talk, just please announcement on whether President Putin is, is going to be here. Is that the announcement that we're going to get this week? Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, we are, also, we are concerned about the instability, particularly in local government, uh, of the coalition arrangements that have been crafted all around. It has led to uh, a lapse in service delivery because parties have been more jostling for positions and uh, in some cases promoting their own interests. And this... In a number of places, it ha is happening at the expense of service delivery and uh, um, serving our people well. So it is concerning. And, uh, of course, this is uh, a result of what uh, the, the citizens of our various uh, cities and metros decided as they voted. So this is now what we have now. Coalitions are always difficult to manage, and we've come to learn from those countries, particularly in the Northern Hemispheres, that have been managing coalitions for a long time. In other cases, they struggle to form governments for periods of up to a year uh, because they, they, they struggle to find commonality and consensus on interests and how people should be positioned and in one case, I was told that a coalition agreement ran up to 500 pages uh, because they had to look at every little aspect. Now, our coalition arrangements have not yet reached that level. And uh, sometimes they are strategic, sometimes they are tactical, and sometimes they are interest-driven. And we do need to mature to a point where uh, if the citizens have decided in whatever way uh, to support various parties, we are able to settle down and form government structures that will function 
and that will, one, give certainty and confidence to our people, but also that will result in better services being delivered. And that is the reason why we are going to be looking at uh, the, a legislative uh, framework that should govern uh, coalitions, uh, whether one should, uh, whether parties should reach a particular threshold before uh, they are able to participate uh, in, in, in the government uh, process. So we are still taking baby steps uh, in the formation of coalitions, and it's bound that we are going to make mistakes. And uh, the unfortunate part is when mistakes are made that have a negative impact on our people. And I am just hoping and hoping that we can all work to a point where uh, we don't craft coalitions at the expense of the interests of the people. Uh, service delivery must continue. It must not be weakened as we put together these coalitions. The issue of uh, making an announcement at a later stage about BRICS is not really going to revolve around that. It's just going to give information to South Africans about the importance of BRICS and what it is going to mean, uh, not only to our own country in terms of uh, promoting our interests, but also to the continent, because we're pivoting this BRICS summit more around uh, BRICS being used as a lever and an instrument to advance the development of our continent. So we will be giving more information about that and, uh, and also hoping and wishing uh, that uh, we have a very successful BRICS summit uh, when it finally happens, when we will have so many countries uh, visiting our country uh, to attend the BRICS summit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I do apologize for the rolling mics are followed as we come just so that we can address the situation of the mic. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Masengo. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. President. Um, just um, uh, two questions. Uh, the one is on law enforcement. Uh, you actually touched on the question I was going to ask about uh, illegal mining, but uh, it obviously is uh, predicated on the criminality and how we are uh, enforcing the laws as a country. You know, we, we, we're having something called construction mafia. Mm -hmm. We're having something called Zamazama, illegal mining. We, and the, the NEC, as you have said, has reflected on those things. Mm -hmm. The questions I think South Africans would want to know, other than you as the government party, the EMC, reflecting and speaking about them, what is it that you are doing practically to make sure that uh, mm. you can't have a school that was started in 2020, Mr. President, it's still not finished because some people just want a share. Mm. You, 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 we're speaking about the Zamazamas now, uh, just uh, about, about five kilometers from where we are, where people were, I mean, they, they, they had to inhale that gas, whatever it is, and then they died. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget what happened in Kruger Stop. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you are doing mm -hmm. as the governing party, as government? Because speaking about it just really is not cutting it with South Africans. I think they want to see sure. something practically happening. Perhaps quickly on breaks, I know my colleague did ask, I'm getting a sense that we may be moving towards a virtual breaks. Uh, is my characterization correct? Thank you. <laughs> on the issue of criminality and the Zamazamas, uh, absolutely right to be raising uh, these issues. And they have been ventilated a lot also uh, in the NEC and indeed uh, in society as a whole. And we have been with the police uh, and other security forces from intelligence and all that, been working on how we are uh, beginning to deal with this problem and this challenge. Now, they are different 
uh, these uh, problems. And of course, there's, there's uh, the construction mafia uh, that uh, proliferates in many parts of the country. And some do it on the quiet. They approach contractors and say, we want 30 percent. We demand it and you can buy us out. Uh, they've become as brazen as all that, and it happens on the quiet, and some people speak out, and sometimes they just storm the construction site, and there are many construction sites uh, around the country. And uh, we, we, we we've, are working on this, and there's a team in the police that is focusing more and more on uh, these. Uh, it's organized crime. Uh, organized crime that manifests itself uh, through pouncing on construction sites and building sites. And the illegal mining process, uh, I have said that it's not only a policing process, but I want all the departments that are involved with the labor, with the, with the minerals and energy to also get involved so that we approach it as a joint program or process from government side. And uh, we, we will be seeing change uh, sooner rather than later because we've got to address this and the sports are known. And of course, you cite the very most unfortunate uh, incident that happened uh, here in, in Kuruleni, but there was another one in the Free State where 31 miners are said to have died underground. And it could even be more. Uh, so these challenges proliferate but we are addressing them and we will come down very hard on those who are involved in criminality and uh, the, the might of the law and the state uh, will be felt because uh, it goes against what we stand for uh, law and order and this is a challenge that we've got to address very 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 firmly uh, we are not going to have a virtual BRICS summit. Uh, we are going to have a uh, physical uh, BRICS summit. And uh, all of us uh, are committed to having a summit uh, where we will be able to eyeball each other. We have not held a physical summit for quite a long time, almost three years now. And uh, so sorry to disappoint you. It's not going to be virtual. Uh. Thank you very much, President. I think the end is coming. So, um, I am looking for people who are going to make remarks. In the meantime, I'm going to do it. Um, afternoon, Mr. President. Thanks for this engagement. It's Yanda Gold from Northern Africa. Um, you've been on a renewal process for quite some time now. You've just remarked about how your NEC is united, you're sort of coalescing around issues and pretty much moving in the same direction. But Mr. President, we continue to see <laughs> reports about um, fractures here and there. I mean, my colleague Hotato uh, Madisha released a report today about you, first they want to know, will you be disciplining your chair? Who's, who's Hotato here? Hotato <laughs> <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> um, over the signing of an MOU, I know that you, this, is, this is about ANC issues, but this speaks to um, you know cohesion. But also, as a part of your renewal process, it was about dealing um, in the main with your deployed to government and issues of state capture. Are you concerned about the type of people that your deputy president is surrounding himself with? If reports are anything to go by, um, some of whom have been implicated in issues of um, state capture, but on top of that, uh, someone who's deemed as a close ally of yours, Mr. Beja Nicholke, this week releasing a statement talking about fake WhatsApps going around, that he's part of a plot to undermine the office of the deputy president. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And just, I am really uh, going, pushing it a bit, this is my training, but your reaction yeah, to mm -hmm. the outcomes of the Palapala report. <laughs> um, I still want to request um, that hopefully I am audible 
Um, but I still want to request that we keep it to one question at a time, uh, so, so that the person can agree to come back again. You misbehaved. <laughs> So let, let's, let's, let's stick to it, uh, Colleague Son, just one question so that he has a chance to apply himself to that specific one, and then we'll continue to do it that way, if that's okay. Thanks very much. I'll see if Kutazo agrees. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I now know Kutazo is. <laughs> now, on the last point, I've noted the PP's report, and that's as, just as far as... Uh, I've noted it, so that's that's what it is. Um, unity is a process. Uh, we are not where we would like to be, but we are on the way to being a united organization. Uh, the divisions that have dogged us in the past are busy melting away as we embrace renewal, as we embrace uh, uh, unity, and as we embrace the rebuilding of the ANC and uh, improving our brand and dealing as openly as possible with the problems and the challenges that have beset our organization in the past. So unity and renewal should never be seen as a one-day event. There will be ups and downs. There will be uh, forward movement and reversals, uh, but we are moving forward. Uh, the forward movement on the way to a united ANC and a renewed ANC, as I said uh, at, the at the January 8th statement, is irreversible and irrevocable. We are moving forward and embracing one another in a much more effective way uh, in the way that we deal with issues and the way that we deal with each other. And of course, uh, you refer to the issues of uh, the deployees, uh, and Khutato um, uh, chose to, to write about uh, what he perceived are disjunctures. Uh, le let me say, we're making a mountain out of a mole hill, really, here. Uh, it's been suggested that when Minister Mantashe was not at the signing of the uh, agreement, MOU rather, uh, with the, when the Dutch Prime Minister and the Danish Prime Minister were here, uh, it was a big snub and a big deal. It wasn't. And uh, things were moving very quickly. And uh, people in his department and uh, other departments and the presidents were moving very quickly. And uh, as he has said, he, he hadn't really read the agreement. But the agreement, the MOU, was signed by government. Uh, so government has signed that. And that is the best commitment that we want. It is the government of the Republic of South Africa that uh, signs these issues and... Uh, Agreements don't always have to be signed by, you know, a specific people. We delegate a number of other people to sign those. And then it is said that there the, the, the is a rupture, as you said, uh, between uh, those who are deployed on policy matters. And I should tell you that Minister Mantashe is the one minister who has signed more renewable um, IPPs than any other. He has signed them by the bucket load, uh, signifying his commitment to government policy because government policy on renewables uh, continues and uh, people are deployed uh, to uh, further that, that, that policy. So there's no issue. The issues that you raise about uh, the deputy president and the people that relates to, he has answered and uh, he will be able to answer that as well. Uh, some of the people are not known to me, uh, but uh, I'm sure you are able to have that type of conversation with him. And uh, I have not had any uh, inkling whatsoever that uh, this uh, 
any form of criminality or whatever. So uh, you you should you should ask him that. Um, you 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 refer to uh, Bejani Chauke's WhatsApp. There has been quite a usage of um, abuse, rather, of WhatsApp numbers. But mine was also <laughs> uh, utilized improperly. Uh, and I think we did issue a statement to that effect. Because all of a sudden I found that my WhatsApp number and my photograph was being used to solicit money from a number of people. And, uh, and uh, one of the people who was my friend called me and said, I just received this message from you. And I said, what message? He said, but in the message I'm supposed to do A, B, C, D, about money. And I said, but I never sent you that message. Then we realized that my number was being abused. Uh, and uh, uh, we are in the process of looking at all that. So this social media stuff and all that, it's utilized in various uh, nefarious ways. And that is precisely what uh, I also went through. Thank you. Yes, it is on. I can hear you, Sidi. Sidi, don't worry. If I hear you, that's all you need. <laughs> Carry on, CD. Oh. But you heard me, that's unfair. Oscar <laughs> to Sandwa. Yeah. Oh, I don't know how else to not. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I hear what you're saying to Zianda about the deputy president. He is told to depress and he is being pushed out of office. What is your sense of what's actually happening there? Even if you are not engaging him regularly, you must be able to he's leading the call. What is your sense of what's happening? Secondly, um, I'll only just ask you, I'll hold the others. Um, from a, from a president, someone lately, I was speaking to him about a month ago, and I said, you know, you came out campaigning for the ANC recently. Will you be campaigning again in 2024? He said, it's a legitimate question that he cannot answer because there are many things that are going wrong that are not being attended to as well as they should be. That feels like an indictment on this leadership of the ANC. Your reaction to that, please. Well, I also saw the report of the City Press and... I had a discussion with the deputy president, and um, and uh, I said, but what is this? And we are going to have another discussion because, and I immediately said to him, I appointed you, and uh, I'm the only person <laughs> who can uh, de-appoint you, and uh, there is just no thought, no plan, no inkling whatsoever that something like that uh, could be in the works. And uh, I would have, you know, to have my own head examined, to have had a deputy president appointed, and thereafter, because I'm the only one who could remove him, uh, unless the party decides so, uh, and, and then do that. So there is no truth or substance uh, to, to that at all, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, the issue of uh, former President Thabo Mbeki um, uh, being asked whether he will campaign, and I think, I mean, there are a number of issues that uh, we uh, have been in conversation with him on, and we will continue to, to do that, uh, and uh, he's a revered and respected leader of our organization, and matters that uh, uh, have to be discussed will be discussed, and of course, we, we would like you know, as many of our leaders as possible uh, to participate in the forthcoming 
uh, elections and uh, we, we will be campaigning very hard uh, and hopefully with as many leaders as possible. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, President, right. I'll now turn to Lukanya. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Lukanya oh. Talata from Newsroom Africa. Mr. President, um, I completely concur with my colleague around the issue of access uh, to you. Uh, and I think, uh, to a large extent, um, your, your cabinet as well and, and your government ministers. I think it, it sometimes becomes very hard for us to be able to tell mm. the real story for South Africans yeah. just simply because we, we don't have access. Yeah. Or by the time that you know we, we are able to get through, yeah. it's two to three days after the fact and we then miss that opportunity for us to be able to do our job, which is largely to, uh, to inform South Africans so we would appreciate going forward, Mr. President, that you know that, that this becomes a much more regular engagement and that we are able to have access to you on a much more regular basis. Now, just to my, uh, the, the issue around my question, you raised the issue of transmission uh, of ESCOM, and obviously, hopefully, lessons having been learned from the generation yeah. uh, side. So now the transmission is going to cost a lot of money, yeah. uh, around $250 billion. There's the issue of rails and ports amongst ground. The real issue, uh, and then you also mentioned something about capacity yeah. uh, as opposed to capability. That's got me very worried because those are two different things. Hopefully in another occasion we'll be able to engage properly because if we don't have capacity, we can hire the people. But if the people that get hired don't have the capability, then we've got a serious problem. But the issue, Mr. President, that I want to raise is just how much, uh, how serious is the ANC taking the issue of accountability within particularly those, uh, within government? Because the issue of Haman's crowd, uh, there were many warnings um, that were issued about that situation, but still it was allowed to happen and people died. So in terms of accountability, we need to be able to hold you a lot more accountable so that's why I'm asking for a lot more regular engagements with you and the government. But also the ANC itself. What is it doing around the issue of accountability? Um, uh, I, and are we going to start seeing a lot more um, people being held accountable? Because corruption, would, if I'm afraid of being held accountable, I'm not going to get into corrupt acts. Basically, so just around the issue of transmission and the issue of accountability, please, Mr. President. I'm sorry for being long winded. Thank you. Quite long winded, <laughs> uh, Maybe on the first one, yes, uh, the issue of access. Uh, we will uh, gear up uh, the accessibility uh, so that you are able to report to South Africans uh, about what we are doing in government. And um, also, it speaks to the accountability aspect that it is through that that you know, we are able to be accountable. So, uh, full agreement on, on that aspect. On the transmission issue, and as I said, we need to come up with uh, in a number of innovative ways. It's, it's a big ticket item to improve the transmission uh, of, of the grid. Uh, or to improve, yes, the, the grid that is transmission. So we, we are going to have to come up with innovative ideas. And some of them uh, would be partnering with, with uh, the private sector, uh, where the money resides, and uh, finding ways of uh, doing so uh, and uh, without um, diluting or minimizing the, the ownership of the grid by the people of South Africa because the grid event, uh, essentially belongs to the people of South Africa uh, as managed by, by, by the state. Uh, so other countries have been able to uh, do quite a lot of innovative things when it comes to improving their own transmission and grid. And by the way, uh, many other countries around the world are also facing exactly the same problem. We focus attention on, on, the, on, on the generation side 
and now we have to face attention uh, place attention on the on the grid or the transmission so a number of options then have to be explored and uh, we're raising it so that we we should not be alarmed at uh, what we need to do it's it's an enormous ask uh, but uh, it's something that has to be done uh, much it's possibly much more serious than uh, the generation part itself because it's going to cost so much more money but we've got to find innovative ways of uh, dealing with that and it's got to be done almost immediately uh, ESCOM has already said as much on the issue of accountability of people who are deployed uh, you're absolutely right we need to uh, improve uh, accountability you're absolutely right when it comes to capacity. Yes, we've got to increase the capacity. And it revolves around skills. It revolves around making sure that people have the know-how. Uh, but uh, capability uh, is, as you say, a different matter. And when it comes, for instance, to the Hammond's Grau, uh, the matter was raised on a number of occasions uh, with uh, the metro and not much was done and that becomes a political problem which needs to be addressed and that's where accountability uh, has to be put in place and for us as we move forward we've got to have the right people in the right doing the right jobs uh, and also through professionalization of the civil service and improving our accountability processes. Uh, we should be able to ensure that things get done a lot better. Uh, it's been the case in the civil service that, yes, even as people have not been able to perform their tasks, uh, nothing much flows, nothing much happens, uh, not leaving out on, at the political level so we've got a number of areas that we need to pay attention to. And uh, we are going to do so because uh, the realization that it militates against the interests of our people has become patently clear. Uh, not that it wasn't clear in the past, but it's something that we've got to address. And we will address it more effectively right now. To avoid a situation like a Hamas crowd, and so we've got to address it at a number of levels. Firstly, to address it through uh, governmental intervention processes. We've got to intervene, but at the same time, deal with lack of performance. And uh, a combination of all that should then be able to, to help us. And to deal with, say, pure negligence and recklessness as well. Uh, as well as dealing with uh, things like uh, not spending money because some of the uh, challenges are that people are afraid uh, to sign off when it comes to having to spend money because they're afraid to make mistakes. And so those are some of the things that we need to deal with. So it's a plethora of things, but we are going to be addressing it. And the more we improve the intergovernmental uh, relationships, the more we will be able to have a number of uh, buttons that we can press just to address these types of problems. Thank you, President. Uh, I'm going to turn to um, John Bader. Uh, Mr. President, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I, speak, I think there are two questions that I would like to ask you. Um, today is exactly two years since we've seen uh, widespread loot looting, especially in KZN and also in our housing. It was almost a uh, orchestrated insurrection that we saw and the impact economically that had, that had on on the country and also especially on uh, small scale businesses in um, in the country. And this morning, uh, well, only one person has been sentenced so far. Um, somebody who went to steal food from, from Woolworths uh, and nobody else has been arrested. This morning again, we saw six uh, trucks being set alight 
on the fund maintenance uh, pass, and immediately that had an impact on the economy and the flow of traffic in that area. So my question is really one that, because it does seem as though it's economic sabotage that we see taking place in this country. How concerned are you about this? Because it's fascinating for me that our intelligence services and our police were not aware of what happens this morning. Because uh, surely there's talk out there. Somebody must know what's happening. Uh, that's the, the, the one concern that I have or question that I want to raise with you. And then the second one is you spoke about the need for direct intervention from national when it comes to local government. Um, how, do you, how do you see this play out? Because a lot of our, our difficulties that we have in South Africa is happening on local government level. Uh, it's the service delivery and the type of people uh, deployed to some of these areas that are not working for us. So how long before we're going to see some changes happening on local government? Thank you very much. Uh, the, I must just respond, respond President. Uh, we've already hit the hour mark, and um, I know that uh, if we stop here, President, um, I will have a massive protest. Um, um, so I will request your indulgence to detain me. Thank you. Thank you, President. <laughs> I will say for. Oh, 30, okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, no, no, 30, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, um, we, I am concerned about uh, these uh, activities that take place that, uh, you know, have a negative impact on our economy and uh, uh, it's almost like economic sabotage because burning six trucks on the main artery of uh, uh, our country in terms of the economy is, is concerning. The intelligence uh, agencies are, are going to be giving me a report on that. So uh, we will be getting that shortly and of course the police themselves will be uh, taking steps to make sure that we forestall what, whatever you know, follow-up activity that uh, those who are behind this may, may well be planning. But we are going to ensure that we go after those people who uh, torched those trucks because it's not acceptable that uh, uh, trucks and uh, facilities that are enhancing our economy are attacked willy-nilly uh, just like that and they should never actually even be attacked. So it is, it is a, a, a real concern. When it comes to the challenges that local government faces, uh, we want to promote more and more the district development model which talks to intergovernmental cooperation. We want to heighten that so that there's more cooperation. No government entity, be it local, provincial, and, and national, should ever think that it can do things on its own. And uh, this is precisely the message I've been stressing, even at national level, that no government department or minister must think that they can work in a silo and just uh, do things uh, on their own without uh, being aware that it affects a whole chain of other processes. Uh, so uh, to enhance intergovernmental uh, cooperation, we, we want national to have a hawk's eye on uh, what is happening. What comes as a real concern to me is often getting reports that budgets have not been spent and some of the money, uh, is money that would have been allocated to local government uh, as either their equitable share as well as uh, the grants that they, they, they should utilize for infrastructure. And when that money is not spent, it basically means that it was money that was available but could not be spent at the expense or to the detriment of ordinary people uh, where those towns or cities are. So 
that is the reason why we want to focus more attention on one, how we can have a proper analysis of what's happening to support our local government uh, entities and where they have challenges, capacity or otherwise, how we can intervene and support them and help them. Because by so doing, we are addressing the needs of our people more broadly. So we, we, we will want to up our game when it comes to that so that we, we, we begin uh, to, to address those things. Many of the things that we have done from a national perspective have worked rather well. For instance, the presidential employment stimulus was coordinated nationally through the various departments, and it worked extremely well. There was no corruption, and it led to almost employment opportunities of some 800 to a million people, 800,000 to a million people. And similarly, a, a variety of other interventions, and which showed and proved that when national, provincial, and local work together, we're able to move mountains and achieve a great deal. And similarly, in this case, for instance, if um, the, the water challenge in, in Royval and Hamanskral, be it the water challenge in Eteguini, uh, or Sunduzi, or anywhere, if we are able to work together uh, in full cooperation, we'll be able to resolve those. So I'm looking forward to this new, uh, if you like, era of being able uh, to, together, uh, utilizing the new method that we've got now, the district development model, breaking down the silos and being able to work together much more effectively, uh, we will be able to achieve a great deal. So I'm, I'm focusing, and uh, in the next few months, we should be able to see appreciable change. It may not happen all over the country at one go, but it's a process that as we, we've been testing and we're finding that it has a great deal of efficacy and it has a great deal of effectiveness as well. Colleagues, that uh, with the time that's been extended, the president still has to claim her own spot in firing his own presidency. Yes. Members of the leadership. Yes, I'm going to. He's allowed to. <laughs> and um, I'm going to take uh, my fellow over there. So I'm, I'm just doing a, zi a zigzag. I see the look from uh, Lizella Tanzo. Um, <laughs> and let's try and keep our questions brief so that everybody has a ch chance to, to bite. Because after this extension, it won't be possible to extend it further. Yeah. Thank We've always focused our attention on our foreign policy, uh, right from uh, the beginning when I became president. And to this end, we've participated in a number of initiatives. And I guess our role during COVID uh, in leading the African continent as chair, uh, in many, many ways, uh, defined 
uh, our approach because our approach has always been pan-African, has always been advancing the interests of our own continent and sometimes some people say maybe the expense also of our own country, but we advance the interests of South Africans uh, first and thereafter we say a better Africa uh, and a more prosperous Africa. And as we do so, we are acutely alive to the fact that we've got to interact with the rest of the world because our own country and indeed our continent is not an island. We, we have to work within the domain of, of, of the world uh, and for the longest time the world has been dominated on a unipolar basis it's now becoming more multipolar and we as South Africa have to relate to the various polarities in the world uh, polities in the world if you like and, uh, and work with them so uh, during COVID, it was largely working with our own continent as well as working, yes, uh, with uh, both the East and the West. And uh, we were able to get assistance uh, when it came to PPEs uh, from uh, the East largely, uh, but also uh, from the West uh, when it came to vaccines. Uh, we had to go and uh, argue our case together with India at the World Trade Organization and interacted with a variety of countries. So it, it and when the war uh, in, uh, in Ukraine uh, started, um, because of the position that we took, which is a position that many have come to understand more, uh, position that said conflicts such as this should rather be resolved through negotiation rather than through might and force. Uh, the appreciation uh, is, 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 is growing. Uh, although we were uh, pillared and uh, criticized uh, on the stance that we took at the United Nations, and we were not the only country that took a position of uh, saying that we are non-aligned, uh, but of course because of the uh, role that we play in the geopolitical situation, we were singled out. Uh, but much as we have been singled out, together with uh, six other countries, we decided that we are going to play a particular role to advance that uh, neutrality. So people have tended to want to paint us uh, into a particular corner, uh, the East. And at times, as you might recall, we've also been painted as being more pro-West, but we've always said that we are non-aligned. And our non-aligned status means that we relate to all countries in the world. Uh, and even in times of war, we have seen ourselves playing a role in uh, various parts of the world advocating the peace option as we have done now. So we will deny the fact that we, uh, are, being, we, we, are, more, we are more east uh, rather than being more west. We are non-aligned. And that gives us a very unique position uh, which many have started to appreciate a unique position in that we can talk to all sides. Uh, this was initially also appreciated by even President of the United States, who said, you can talk to President Putin. And uh, indeed, as we have gone out, we have spoken to both sides, Zelensky and Putin, and both of them have found us acceptable. Uh, and they found us to be uh, interlocutors that they can deal with, and honestly and openly. And that is a position that uh, can only really be properly occupied by uh, a party or a country that has decided on a particular cause, which is that non-alignment. 
And I guess this we've learned from the great Nelson Mandela because uh, that, is, that was his approach also to international relations. He was able to talk to all parties, whether they were in a conflict or not. And this is the policy position that we intend to pursue going forward because we've seen how beneficial it is. One of the important outcomes of our engagement on the Ukraine-Russia war is that we are, both presidents have agreed to continue engaging with us. They are going to continue engaging with us. There are certain things that you know, President Zelensky has asked us uh, if we could uh, do, and similarly, President Putin. And we find that that is an important role uh, we can play uh, to hopefully contribute to the peacemaking process. So in, in the end, I think it's, it's an important role uh, that we, we, we can advance. And with the geopolitical situation being as fluid as it is now, we believe that it's important uh, that a country like South Africa uh, should be able to play uh, it's it's long stated role. Uh, this position uh, is not new. Uh, it emanates from way back, and uh, uh, it's been consolidated and strengthened now because of the challenges that uh, we're having to, to to grapple with. There was another subsidiary question you asked. It's about uh, the one currency. Oh yes, the, the the issue of the currency. Yes. We have said that we need to get to a point where Africa, as Africa integrates and unites, should have one currency. And we've, uh, we've had that being advocated by a number of people. When we were in Paris, uh, President uh, Lula da Silva, president of Brazil, raised the issues about uh, the, you know, the dollar. And uh, he said, you know, this needs to be discussed. And I said, well, uh, this is an issue that should, yes, become a topic also uh, in the forums that we are going to be holding going forward. So uh, it is a matter that needs to be discussed, and uh, it's not an issue that is going to find an easy solution right away. Uh, it's a more long-term issue, and uh, it's, it's a matter that we should not deal with as though it's a holy cow. It needs to be discussed. Uh, just as we have to discuss an African currency issue. Thank you, President. Um, I'm told that I'm left with 15 minutes. I'm going to turn to uh, Lisa And we are now, um, the other colleagues who wish to say something to the President are now at the mercy of Lisa in terms of uh, the, no, Chris, the, 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 the questions have got to be the questions have got to be short in order for to get the other colleagues who still wish to speak before mm -hmm. we can release the president and, and take the president's own last question, which he so wishes, which I do hope you will, President. I will. And um, so let's try and keep it brief. I'm, I'm sure I'll try to extend the time, but I can't go beyond this. Please proceed. I'll try to be brief. Uh, Mr. President, this is Mr. Kizega, Kadwa from the Daily Guardian. Uh, Mr. President, you've often been called uh, indecisive. Uh, some people have called, have said that you frustrated uh, various stakeholders, business, <laughs> and internally in the ANC, some have said that you know the inclusion of an electricity minister was not necessary. In fact, this was done to uh, allay some of your, your allies, Gwede um, Mandashe, Pravin Gordon, for instance. <laughs> You're going into the last uh, tail end of your term. Uh, would you say that uh, this has worked for you in terms of you being so process driven and not really getting into a situation where you decide, as many have asked you to, uh, would you say that this has worked for you? Accountability, Mr. Pre President, uh, not only relates to uh, government, but it also relates to the private sector as well. Uh, what I want to find out from you, in terms of the private sector, I say this because recently we had a sit-down with Sikhia Zigalala, your Minister of Public Works, 
and gave us quite startling figures, one of which is that Eastern Cape and the Northern Cape have a backlog of about 3,000 schools that have not been built, which would be about 68 years said to build them, and it would be in the tune of 70 billion. And this would be drastically reduced if uh, private sector would come, uh, would meet you halfway. When, where is, why is it that you haven't been able to meet halfway with the private sector? I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, the issue that you raised about uh, this uh, issue of being process driven. Um, uh, there's just nothing wrong with process. Uh, if this, you're disturbing me, Zaka, she's listening. There's nothing wrong with, with process. And I've often said that you, know, you need to look at uh, what I call PSP. It's, it's people, systems, and process. You look at how people are deployed and whether they are deployed in a way that they will do the work that they should and set in place the systems that will enable them to be effective. And uh, once that has been done, to have a process which is predictable, uh, which uh, will enable things to get done. Uh, so yes, I do lay emphasis on, on process because that is a guarantee that things will continue being done rather than uh, sort of one short type of uh, interventions that end there and uh, they, you haven't set up a system and a good process to, to get things done more effectively. Uh, when those people that uh, you talk to, uh, um, for instance, I'll give you a good example. When uh, I decided that to address our electricity challenges, I needed somebody who would be focused, who would be able to, uh, to spend every hour of the day, every hour, on just electricity. And I decided that I wanted an electricity minister. I didn't consult anyone. I said, I'm the president. I'm deciding that this is what uh, will work for us. And that's when people said, you didn't consult, you didn't uh, uh, ask us, you didn't come to us. I said, oh, now when I say I want things done, you want to revert to that system that you said you didn't like of too much consultation. So there are moments when, yes, you've got to be able to take decisions and move on. There are moments when you've got to consult. And uh, I've utilized both where I've said, on this one, I am going to move forward. And if you have any issues or complaints, we'll deal with them while the train is moving. And that's precisely what I have done. And it was not to protect anyone. It was just to get the th work done. And I did say right at the beginning that I am going to divide the work that needs to be done in as far as energy is concerned uh, Minister of Minerals and Energy will continue to focus on the regulatory part. That they mu he must do. And the Minister of uh, Public Enterprises will continue to focus on the governance part of the entity that should deliver electricity to us. And then Minister of Electricity must focus on the work that needs to be done to ensure that generation does indeed happen and uh, we get out of uh, the load shedding that we have. And now, all of these are bearing fruit, and people never pause to think about that. They never pause and say, wow, uh, you, 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 you were right. Uh, because things are moving forward. Uh, moving forward, and as far as the regulatory framework is concerned, we are going to be issuing another uh, round of uh, IPPs, uh, that is on the way, and the regulations are being done as far as uh, the reforms that we focused on. Uh, on the governance side, the restructuring of ESCOM is happening into uh, generation, transmission, as well as distribution, and all that is happening, and including the setting up of a structure 
that will coordinate our state-owned enterprises. And uh, on, the, uh, on the electricity side, Minister Ramakhopa is just running with the ball. And uh, getting to a point where we now realize that we've got to deal with transmission a lot earlier. ESCOM has always been given almost the sole responsibility of dealing with transmission. And now we're saying it is much broader. It's a national issue. It just does not reside in ESCOM alone. So that realization has now been brought firmly uh, to our faces because we've got a focused minister on transmission. So had I listened to all these noises uh, of uh, consult, this and that, we wouldn't be where we are. And I've given leadership, and uh, yes, you want it to be led, be led, because we are moving forward now, and we are going to get things done. On the issue of accountability, you asked the question, what was it? Oh, yes, the private sector. Yes, the private sector obviously has to be mobilized to work with us. The issue of, say, for instance, schools. Responsibility for building schools has always been a government uh, type of uh, uh, role, including your other social infrastructure uh, facilities like hospitals and all that. But more and more, we are, we are now saying we, we need uh, as much help as we can, including coming up with financial, innovative ways of shortening the period that we need to have to build all the schools that we should have in our country. Uh, it's 68 schools, for instance, for the Northern Cape. It's 75 years that it will take us for the schools in Limpopo. So we say... There must be, and there are ways in which we can mobilize finance and the private sector can also play a role in all that. And you ask the question, why have we not been able to succeed in doing so? We've been working with the private sector on a number of issues, and, uh, but we need the private sector to put more and more shoulder to, to wheel. And there are a number of financing options that they can participate in. Uh, which I want them to, to be part of going forward. Thank you, President. I'm advised that we are left with uh, five minutes. And so I'm only going to take just one uh, question. Um, you raised your hand earlier. Is it down? If you're covered, I'm happy. Uh, the petrol. Uh, then I can take my brother over there. No, you are having a you are having a brain wave. So I will take my brother over there. That will be the last question. Um, you put your hand down and then it went up and down. So, uh, so it's not it's not on us. No, we we I've given my brother there. I don't think any cap the question is there. In two minutes uh, we can do that. That's a useful suggestion. So depends on how we, it becomes brief as well. My name is David. I'm from Phoenix, this is China. And my question is, we've seen there's an increasing interest of a lot of countries around the world to attend the Afghan summit in South Africa. Yeah. As well as, I saw the new basket that uh, all of the African head of states have been invited to, to attend the summit as well. So, and South Africa is playing a critical role now at the international stage. My question, Mr. President, what is going to be different in this time? Okay, thank you very much, Pat. Now, Judge, um, I'm going to go in that order. Judge Pat? We really need to make short and sweet now. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Government's party leadership using state resources or abusing state resources. 
Uh, how do you respond to such criticism that you are giving the, uh, uh, the law enforcement agencies to wage your war? The last question, one question, and one question from Mr. Kato, and then we close. President responds, the President then closes by firing on off his own question. One question, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Mashenge. Uh, Mr. President, my name is Mawande. I work for the Sunday World. My really short and simple. When you came in, there was this whole euphoria of, and talk of the new drug, but I mean, many things seem to sh should have worsened since then, unemployment, low trading, I may go on and on, on, but because of time, I'm limited to those as an example. What's the new drug I forced on? And going forward, how do you survive the situation? You've been in office now for going for six years. You are probably left with a lot of time, but of course, the President will then see the day that you have the right time to take it forward. How do you survive the situation? And what kind of legacy do you leave behind as President of the Mother? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Kato? Uh, Mr. Kato, my name is Dr. Sunday Time. Uh, President, have you had time to reflect or engage around what took place in Poland? Um, maybe let me just keep it there. Uh, have journalists been stopped, uh, uh, accusations of abusions on planes, um, and all of that? Have you had time to engage? And frankly, what is your view around what took place there? Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure, I didn't write any of these, uh, and you fired too many. <laughs> okay, what is going to be different with this uh, summit? I guess what's going to be different is the interest that is being shown by so many countries who want to be present. The other one is and uh, you didn't ask the question, a number of countries want to join BRICS. Uh, up to 11 or 12 countries uh, want to join BRICS, and that is what is different. And uh, we're going to reflect on that, and we often take decisions by consensus. So that is going to be a different take. And of course, the geopolitical situation now in the world calls for us to reflect uh, on, on what is happening in the world uh, because we're no longer dealing with suppositions or things that could happen. We're dealing with an existential type of uh, situation that is unfolding right in front of our eyes. So we, we're going to have to talk to, to, to all that. And of course, uh, the other thing that will be different is the immediate... Uh, needs of our continent for development, for uh, support, for, for finance um, in pursuing uh, prosperous uh, futures for the continent, uh, particularly in a world that is now driven by new technology as well as uh, climate change. So those are things that are going to be very, very top of the agenda at the summit as, as we uh, get together. Uh, then, and then we had, um, and in no particular order, the one about the promise of the new dawn. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, I, 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 I've often given quite a lot of thought also to that. And the period that I became president has possibly become the most challenging period that any president uh, in democratic era has ever faced. No other president has gone through or has faced the challenges that not only I face, but the whole country faces. And the other day I was counting the various challenges. They came to about 14 that have really um, been so huge as to impede our way to move forward. State capture, none of my predecessors dealt with. And state capture, in more ways than one, really broke down the capability of the state in a variety of ways to a point where various institutions of state, having been broken down, could not 
function as they should have. And when you are leading in a situation like that, uh, you don't immediately have a silver bullet. You don't immediately have a wand to uh, wish all those things out. You've got to painstakingly work at all those challenges uh, to rebuild institutions, institutions that were completely captured, broken down, and uh, you're dealing with the people, you're dealing with processes, you're dealing with all. And these are key institutions that should play a key role. For instance, when it comes to state-owned enterprises, uh, the capital investment in our country has largely been driven by the investment of state-owned enterprises. Uh, and they were broken down. Uh, the rail ones, the port ones, and you name them. And uh, therefore, you were really starting from ground zero. And none of my predecessors had to deal with that. Then you had COVID. Then you had <laughs> the unrest. Then you, you name them all. So uh, I, I would say that in terms of getting to grips and dealing with these issues, um, we, we, we are making progress. We're making progress to, to rebuild the state capability. And of course, South Africans want it to be done today, uh, yesterday. But it takes quite a lot of doing. Uh, we are rebuilding that capability uh, in, in a number of uh, s state institutions. I mean, our state-owned enterprises, uh, the process of repositioning them is ongoing, and it will take time. We, we dealt with COVID, uh, and some people criticized the way we dealt with it, but at the same time, we saved lots of lives. And many countries that faced the same challenges we did at the same time took a different path to disastrous uh, outcomes for, for their people. Uh, and the reforms that we have embarked upon. Some of them are in areas that should have been dealt with almost 20 years ago. Now we are dealing with them. And if you like, it has now become my problem. And I accept it as my problem, the problem of my presidency, which I've got to address. And I harness the strengths and the team and the people that I have at hand right now so that we can work together to correct all these things. So the challenge of unemployment, my dear brother, our economy has not been able to create the sufficient level of jobs for a very long time. And it continues to rise. We 2008 was a defining moment when our job creation level started going down. Not 2018 when I came in, 2008. But this has been going on for the longest time. And we, we come in to this term at a time when the economic challenges uh, that face our country, and indeed the world, ha have been on the rise. Um, and I would say in, in many, many ways, uh, we, we have done what we could to advance the interests of South Africans. You ask a question, or was it you, was it my uh, earlier brother, on st using state resources. I have no knowledge of that, because uh, uh, even with this whole Parapara issue, we left it to state agencies to do the work undisturbed, uh, uninterrupted as much as they possibly could. And that's what uh, has been the case without abusing state resources. Uh, observance of the rule of law is rather important for me. It really is. And th there needs to be a rule of law. And uh, if we derelict that or, uh, and we don't t take it seriously. We, 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 we are a country on a path 
uh, that that is completely wrong. What was the other question? It is uh, uh, regarding the situation that faced uh, the team of South African women. Oh yes, <laughs> yes, yes. In Poland. Yeah, in 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 Poland. Yes, th it's it is very concerning. Prior to all that news breaking out, we had had a meeting with the president of Poland who had interrupted his holiday to meet us, and it was a courtesy call. I felt that we needed to go and pay a courtesy call to him uh, and also to say, as he had invited us to visit Poland, we have not been able to, we will do so. So it was a hello, courtesy call, and all that. And I got really concerned and disturbed when I had all uh, these uh, uh, challenges that uh, those who were going to travel uh, with us, security and journalists, uh, were not able to get passage through, through Poland. And on our side, the process of actually finding out exactly what happened is ongoing. Uh, so those, those discussions and fact-finding processes are ongoing and I'm waiting for the report to be given to me. Was that the last question? That was, that was the last question. Question, question on, on, on how far are you with the engagement with President oh. I thought I had answered it in yes. one shape or another. Uh, that it's not only President Putin, it's all the leaders of uh, the BRICS countries. Uh, so how far am I? Ooh, how many meters is it there <laughs> from here to there? So we are in, in those discussions. And as I said, once that is done, we'll be able to uh, you know, talk about BRICS and its impact and, and uh, what uh, it's going to do for our continent and our country, and also say quite a bit about what we are doing on the foreign policy side. If that was the end, can I ask my question? <laughs> my question has to do with precisely this peace mission because the sense that I got uh, was that the international media uh, saw this in a completely different light than the South African media. Uh, the South African media, and you, you were denied access, uh, but so were many of them who actually commented, uh, were... The, the, internet, the South African media was also very negative, very negatively disposed. And it was almost like, you know, this is a non-event and so forth. And yet, in our view, it was quite historic that a group of African leaders would travel 3,000 kilometers or so to go to another continent to go and sue for peace. And yet here at home, why was it seen in such negative light? In terms of its historic importance and its political significance. And yes, admittedly, you address the important issue of, of not being able to be there, being trapped in Poland and all that, uh, and obviously being very critical of that. And I did come out and said, uh, I will want to make sure that when we travel with media, uh, which I will want to do, I hope you come along, uh, we, we should make all the necessary arrangements because you have to do your work uh, and you have to give coverage, whether it's positive or negative. Uh, it matters very little to me, but uh, all facilities need to be put in place for you to do your work. But my question is, why is it that there was so much negativity and no appreciation. Please answer me. Joe, I didn't know that you were so... <laughs> Decorum. I have got a fellow uh, Sun Fellow who's uh, raised 
perspectives yeah. around this question from yeah. yes. the president. Yes. Um, and I, I would wish to invite him to comment. And then I'm also, I saw Kanita also was the first to raise her hand. So we'll take just those two, maybe can we reflect the perspectives of other colleagues. My view as the president of the Republic and as the president of the Republic of the it's about two different issues. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. of the South people, South African media, has inadvertently and indirectly taken a posture mm. when mm -hmm. it comes to international global talks with this dynamic. Some media houses are pro yeah. Ukraine, some media houses are starkly or positively pro, pro Russia. But also, it's an issue of undermining. African leaders and the role they play ah. when it comes to global geopolitics. Mm. And also, your government's lack of transparency when it comes to an international relations policy and framework. For instance, your administration, Mr. President, has somewhat not been too open when it comes to your posture, when it comes to global politics. As I said earlier on, it's only now in your latter part of this administration that you are more forthright and more open on international relations as opposed to your failure. But also, South African media, they always say in the newsroom, if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't cry. Yes. And that's where the problem starts. Mm. Not only within the media space, but also within a governmental space. The disjuncture between the two has created a gap where only negative stories make it to the headlines, yep. and that is problematic, but also the inefficiency of the various administrations that, that have been in power have led to the media focusing on, if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't, it doesn't bleed. bleed. Mm -hmm. Very simple. Okay. For the most part, <laughs> not all of them. Um, <laughs> I'll take uh, to a <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Very quickly, the media in Africa, and I think it's not only Africa, Mr. President, it's difficult then to paint everyone in such a same light. Okay. Um, uh, the, 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 when we talk about how international media positions this versus uh, South African media, the, the reality is, is that um, there's a lot of um, you know, really fundamental, serious problems that, that, mm -hmm. that dog our government that creates this negative assertion that any, any positive sort of impact we seek to uh, um, achieve on a, on a national, or an international scale is not going to sort of filter down to the real time challenges. And for example, um, you know, when you see this kind of incoherence or this, this uh, uh, you know, planning issues, it kind of is symptomatic of this government who's inefficient, mm -hmm. you know. So there's this, there's this thing, and you cannot blame an ordinary South African family to say, oh, this government is battling through basics and water and South African. Mm -hmm. So why should we then care about what you do? 3,000 kilometers away, although me and you can agree that it has a fundamental consequence mm -hmm. um, on it. So uh, to, to just a, a, another point from my colleague, I was in the U.S. when this, when this trip was happening, and obviously there's a different way the U.S. Uh, media relates to, 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 to the conflict versus what yeah. how, how, how we do. Um, the reality of it is that the incoherence affects our reporting because you uh, you know, we traveled to Dakar once, and we were so stunned in terms of the EU, for example. We so e echo similar sentiments in Paris, right? But there's never an ownership of, we are doing this for this reason. So even with Brits, we've all come to view in that regard, say, what, 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 what do you want, Mr. President? Mm -hmm. what is, what do you, so there's never a world where we can go on television mm -hmm. or in our uh, uh, forums to say, so President Solomakosa as South Africa, and we as South Africans, only a position because there's this wishy-washy type of mm. attitude, mm. and so and so when someone comes to to uh, or the, uh, if a narrative is saying, why go and deal with Ukraine? You didn't deal, deal with Sudan. You don't deal with Mozambique. You don't mm. deal. Those are you know those are, those are valid questions. Mm. So I am intervening in Ukraine for X reason. Mm. I'm not putting resources in Sudan or in for X reason. Or I'm doing this for Sadek in Mozambique mm. for this mm. reason. So there's that that I think the communication is. Yep. All right, thank you very much. Those were very, those were, those were elevated very responses. Those were elevated responses. I'm very good. sure they covered everyone. Very good. But I do wish, uh, before I hand over to the president, to just uh, reflect on what has been said. Um, I do wish to, to really thank members of the media 
for, for coming through and also for projecting a culture of wanting to converse um, because it's a two-way thing. We aim to work in a client-centric environment. You are a primary client, so we're going to be doing this work together. I would ask though that we keep um, a light, as light as possible. Uh, we don't shout at each other, we speak <laughs> collegially uh, because it makes it for a much more collegial environment. But I do wish to thank everybody and for the questions posed to the to the KMA to President. Over to you, President, and then you can just close us out as well. Of course, thank uh, you. Well, let me say thank you very much. I had occasion a few weeks ago to interact with many of your editors, uh, or I don't know what you call them, in Cape Town. Was it Cape Town? No, it was in Pretoria. Sorry, it was in Pretoria. And we, yeah, Union Buildings. We, we had a really good exchange, of, though it was Chatham House rules, but it was an effort for, for them to, to get to understand uh, you know, some of the things that we are doing. And we gave them a fairly good and extensive presentation of the work that we are doing. And uh, even I was impressed with uh, some of the things that we've been doing because uh, uh, we've, we've been able to, to do things that have not been done for years, and uh, which comes to the question of, uh, uh, you know, things have gotten worse and indeed the situation that confronts us has made things really go get worse. But uh, the exchange was good, as this one was. And I'd like to, to thank you for being here. Uh, sometimes it takes too long. And uh, once it happens, uh, I rather also enjoy it, although you are just too tough in your questioning. Uh, <laughs> And uh, when I leave, I always have scars on my back uh, <laughs> with the line of questioning. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I'd like to say, Matlengi, that yes, we should, we should do this uh, a little bit more often. Uh, time is always a problem. Uh, and uh, we, we will uh, try to, to find the time. And thank you very much for responding to my question because I found your answers very enlightening. And in many ways, what you have said is, is quite true. And there are things that we also need to pay attention to. Because as you say, and it is a fair criticism, that uh, we, we have not always been forthright and forthcoming, and uh, maybe we haven't really owned uh, certain initiatives, and we need to be more upfront in owning them. So I take that to heart, and I thank you for, for that, because that is uh, important feedback, at least for me, so that we uh, know exactly how uh, we can take things forward. It's actually also good advice. Uh, so you don't need to send your invoice, but I take it <laughs> as, as good advice. So thank you very much. I've, I've really uh, liked this moment that we've spent with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you can selfie. Yes, you can selfie. Yeah. Oh. Okay. 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 Okay.